So secularism is an important idea, but as we see in France, it too, like religion, can be hijacked by extremists. Madame Le Pen invokes secularism not as a means of bringing equal rights to all, but as a stick for beating Muslims. It's not difficult to rabble-rouse in a country that suffered so tragically from the actions of the fanatics who threaten us all. But what she is proposing is not secularism or laïcité, as we would understand it. In reality, she's appealing to a kind of Christian triumphalism. Christianity for her, though, represents what she calls real France. In truth, she means white France. Her de definition of Christianity amounts to simply not Muslim. It will be a shame if those who are misusing secularism in this way triumph, because it will bring the whole concept into disrepute. Secularism does not take religious sides. It has no theological favourites. Under a real secular constitution, religion gets on with its business separately from the state and vice versa. Neither should interfere with the other unless the bounds of law and justice are being breached. I'm particularly pleased this afternoon that we have a secularist who is also a Muslim to present our prizes. She's living proof that secularism and Muslims can coexist happily, if, if given half a chance. She co-founded a British Muslims for Secular Democracy in 2006. She's a journalist and a commentator and a pundit. And earlier this week, she won the Broadsheet Columnist of the Year title at the Press Awards. She's gained her reputation by not always being predictable. She trades sometimes controversial opinions, uh, and we like that at the NSS. We're, we're all for free speech and the free exchange of opinions. So please welcome Yasmin Ali Bey Brown. I really didn't know so many people would be gathered, and I would have dressed up a bit more to compete with you, but obviously. Um, that can't happen now, but thank you very much. I just want to say a couple of um, uh, uh, really important things. The thing I find interesting and frightening at the moment, especially when I talk to young Muslims, is how few of them understand what secular means. And I think if there's one job the society probably needs to do is to make sure everybody understands secularism is not atheism. Atheists are part of the secular, uh, whatever it, we call it, uh, but you can have faith and be a secularist. And I don't know how, in our education system, this fundamental message has failed to get through to young people. So a plea, really, if you can come up with something so that people don't fear it as irreligious, it might be very good, especially for the younger generations, of, in some ways, very troubled and confused um, young Muslims. Two other very important points. After the ruling last week um, uh, from the um, um, Court of Human Rights, I've been so shocked by, the, again, the misunderstandings. The problem is not that, you know, uh, Muslims are being attacked. Muslims are being attacked. I'm attacked every minute of my life. It's the exceptionalisms that have grown and grown. So Muslim exceptionalism, whether it's school uniform or a hundred different things, has taken root. Jewish ex exceptionalism has also taken root, and Christian exceptionalism is the norm if one thinks about the history of it. And I think it's the exceptionalism and, uh, that needs to be challenged, and the universalism needs to be promoted. I went to a school in Delhi not that long ago. A thousand young girls in the school is a very Muslim city, at least the part I was in. There wasn't a single girl with a headscarf, so I asked the young headmistress, said, nobody wears a headscarf. And she looked at me, very puzzled. And she said, well, why would they? So I said, it's the uniform, she said. You understand the meaning, uniform. I said, yes, I know, but has anybody asked? And she said, yes, once, family from Blackburn. <laughs> Um, 
So, I, and the two other very quick points. Um, when, when the faith I grew up with, faith was in your heart. Faith was your relationship with God. Faith was indoors, after the satanic verses. And that wasn't the fault of Muslims. I think there were a lot of things that happened then that created a whole them and us situation. But it, my faith, anyway, started coming outdoors and becoming very noisy and very demanding and very uh, political. And in a sense, the saddest thing is that the, the inner faith, the faith that was indoors and in our hearts, seems to have been replaced by this almost totally and constantly disgruntled, paranoid, noisy thing that calls itself religion, a faith, but is actually a kind of political religion. I find this very depressing. Um, I've been recently to India. I've been to India a lot. In my last visit, which was four weeks ago, five weeks ago, I was truly shocked at how this once secular nation, how Hindu fanaticism, it has crept up at every level, at every level of society. It took no time. Modi came in, Modi was a banned person, remember? And it is now at every level of society. So, and, it, and we see what's happened in Turkey. Um, and we have to also remember here how religion, well, churches blessed, a lot of churches, black churches, blessed Trump. Never forget that, as did many Muslims, something like 23% of American Muslims voted for this man, okay, because they thought he was religious when I talked to them. Um, we have the daughter of a churchman here, the Mrs. May, the Mrs. May, who refuses the fundamental principle of Christianity, refuses to take in refugee children, okay, Christ the baby was a refugee child. And so the way religion has become privileged and powerful and the way secularism is now cast as the enemy, we have a lot of work to do. And I wish you much luck with the project because like so many other struggles, we thought things were going to get better and we have receded into a very dark age wherever we are. I'm sorry to make you miserable after your pudding. <laughs> Do I?